thank you. I'm really nervous. This is my first time speaking to a huge crowd like this. So, uh, yeah. So, just thank you. Um, just a quick, quick word about uh, Matt's talk just now. It was really cool. I really like the idea of types. Uh, I also love dark typing, and uh, it allows me to do things like this. It's awesome. Yep. And um, oh yeah. And by the way, um, yeah, like I said, I'm actually very nervous. So uh, because if I screw up, I'm going to screw up in front of 300 people. And I don't know whether I should come back to the Ruby conference again. But uh, by the way, uh, there's coffee outside, and they're actually powered by Scala. Yeah, so I was thinking maybe that's a hint there, man. Maybe I should go to a Scala community next time. So, yeah. <laughs> okay, so, oops. Hi, uh, by the way, my name is uh, Jason. Uh, uh, this is my Twitter handle, and this is my GitHub handle. I actually work at, work at SourceClear. Uh, it's a startup based in San Francisco. We are actually an uh, open source security company. So we actually look at your open source libraries and lets you know whether of them, any, any one of them is vulnerable and lets you know how to fix it. Oh, something happened to the screen. Okay. Anyway, so, um, yeah, I'm going to talk about how to slay a dragon. So you might think, what, what's up with the talk title? Is it, has it anything to do with Daenerys and his tender dragons, Game of Thrones? Nope. Uh, it's actually reference to uh, this book right here. It's actually a, a very famous uh, university textbook used for uh, their compilers course. So it's also known as the Dragon Book. So, uh, and, but the thing is that people think that when they want to implement a programming language or write a compiler, they have to read this textbook. So, um, but today I'm going to show you that you don't, and I'm going to actually show you how easily that you can um, implement your own programming language and in our favorite language, Ruby. Yeah, so, but you might think, why? Why, why do we have to implement a programming language? First of all, it's fun. Uh, at least to me, I think it's fun. And um, you get to understand how programming languages work. And you get to understand how your code works. So uh, you might get this kind of error sometimes in your code. You, and you, uh, once you actually implement a programming language, you, get, you actually understand why you're getting this error. And you get to put yourself in the shoes of a language designer like Matt's here. Um, yeah, don't ask me why he's wearing that Python cookbook shirt. Yes, yeah, but his shirts are really cool. Yeah, like I said, so you get to put yourself in the shoes of a language designer, and you get to appreciate things like, oops, uh, garbage collection and scoping rules. So today, I'm actually going to show you how to implement a language, and the language we're going to implement is Lisp. Yeah, so we're going to make a Lisp. So why Lisp? Because it's super easy to implement. Uh, you can actually implement this in a single page of code right here. Yeah, believe me, it's just a single page, page of code, so you probably can't see. And there are tons of guides online. So over here, we have uh, uh, Peter Novick. He wrote a guide on how to implement a libs interpreter in Python. There's a guide uh, that's called Build Your Own Lisp. But it's in C. So if you're thinking of contributing to C Ruby and you want to learn C, check out this guide. And um, lastly, last but not least, uh, is this repository that I found. Uh, it's, it actually contains uh, 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 this. It actually, basically, it has uh, a Lisp implemented in 56 languages, including Ruby. And it has a very nice step-by-step -step guide. And it's really easy to understand because there's diagrams. We all love diagrams, right? Because it's a lot easier to understand. So, uh, and also, when you implement, uh, when we implement this, you actually understand how we actually influence Ruby. So, Matt's back in uh, 2006, he actually wrote this in an email to the Ruby Talk uh, mailing list. Uh, he said this, and I zoom in for you just in case you can't see. He says, Ruby is a language designed in the following steps. Take a simple list language, remove macros as expressions, Add simple object system, much simpler than clause. Add blocks, add methods found in small talk, add functionality found in Perl. And this is how he concludes. So Ruby was a Lisp originally, in theory. Let's call it Matt's Lisp from now on. Yes, so I propose, since Matt was saying he wants to move Ruby forward, so to help move Ruby forward, I propose we change the name to Matt's Lisp from now on. 
And I even designed a logo for it. <laughs> and I, I realized that the domain name wasn't bought by anyone, so I decided to design a website and bought a domain. <laughs> by the way, it's real. You can actually go to the website and check it out. Yeah, try out Matt's lips. It's a cool language. Right, so anyway, uh, get to the serious stuff. Uh, on to the serious stuff. Let's get started building our Lisp. So like I said just now, I'm going to follow this guide. Uh, you can actually check it out and, and do check it out. I really encourage you to check it out. I've been seeing this so many times. All right, so um, and this implementation of Lisp is called MEL. Uh, why do I say it's an implementation of Lisp? Because there are tons of implementation of Lisp. So um, his implementation of Lisp is called MEL. It's short form for make a Lisp. Yep, and um, before we start to implement it, I'm pretty sure none of you know not, not none of you, I'm pretty sure Matt's know Lisp, but uh, I don't think a lot of you know how to write Lisp and how to read Lisp. So I'm gonna teach you uh, Lisp in less than five minutes. Yeah, so uh, right over here, uh, we have a repo uh, uh, or, or an interpreter. So I'm gonna type code in, just pretend. I know this is PowerPoint, but play along with me. Okay, so just pretend I'm gonna type code in and the result is gonna be evaluated and, and up comes the result, results. So um, here is a piece of code. Uh, can someone just shout out what do you think this will be evaluated to? <laughs> Any other smarter guesses? Oh, no, just kidding. <laughs> Any other guesses? <laughs> eight, yes, I, I heard eight. Okay, right, so uh, what you have here is actually a Lisp form on an expression. It's usually enclosed in parentheses or brackets, depending on which part of the world you come from. And um, we have uh, this right here. What do you think this will be evaluated to? Minus four, that's right. You guys are really smart. All right, what about this? Six, nice. And this right here, true. Thank you. Okay, a difficult one. What's this? 42, yes. That's the right answer. And right here, this is how we um, define a function in MEL. So we will use a fn star uh, in our expression. So followed by the, parent uh, the parameters and close in square brackets and followed by the function body. So this function actually helps us to, um, it's, it's actually a function that multiplies it parameter by itself. Yeah, this is similar to how we do this in uh, Ruby by using Lambda. And um, to actually call it, uh, we put, uh, we enclose uh, the function and the parameters in a pair of parentheses again. In the first position, position we put the function that you wanna call and followed by the arguments. And it will give us 64. And this is similar to how we do this in Ruby. We just call dot call and pass in the arguments. So if you want to give it a name, just use def, followed by the name you want to name it. I, I'm naming it sq, uh, short for square. And uh, I will call it the same way. Just put the name of the function and the parameters and give us 64, just as expected. So now you know basic Lisp. <laughs> All right, simple, right? So. Um, and I'm going to give a very, very quick introduction to interpreters. So because we're going to write a programming language, we're going to have to write the interpreter for it. So an interpreter basically takes code. Um, yeah, it goes into the interpreter. And it actually evaluates directly on a machine. But unfortunately, that is so Ruby 1.8. We are no longer doing that. So what we're going to do is that we're going to take the code, compile it to bytecode, and run it uh, on a virtual machine so that it's evaluated directly on a machine, the real machine. But you might think, oh, what the heck is a virtual machine? So a virtual machine basically interprets bytecode. So bytecode is uh, basically a, a bit higher level than native code. And um, a virtual machine is also an abstraction layer between the bytecode uh, and the native machine. So we can actually write the same bytecode for different kind of machines, be it uh, ARM or uh, x86. So you might think, hmm, uh, actually, no, I'm not actually gonna do this in MRI. I'm actually gonna use Rubinius. So you might think, why, why Rubinius? Rubinius is just another implementation of Ruby. So actually, Rubinius is not just an implementation of Ruby, it's also a, a language platform. 
So it lets you easily implement a language in it. So uh, and it lets you customize the parser and the abstract syntax tree. And I'll show you how later on. So let's dive in. So in short, what we're going to do is that we're going to customize Rubinius's compilation pipeline. There's two things we're going to customize. First is the parser, and second is the abstract syntax tree. For the parser, um, there are three steps to it. First is the tokenizer. Second is the reader. And third uh, is the parsing logic. So for the tokenizer, uh, by its name suggests, it just tokenizes code. So it will take code and uh, produce tokens. So my tokens are basically parentheses, um, symbols, and literals. Uh, and it will return an array of uh, tokens like this. How am I going to do it? Uh, it's very simple. I'm just going to use this regular expression and apply on a string. Yeah. It's kind of like cheating, right? <laughs> okay, so uh, that's why I say it's actually easy to implement a language, uh, a list, uh, and, and um, it's really simple. My lexer is just, um, my, my tokenizer is just a piece of regular expression. <laughs> yeah, so, but, yeah, so actually you can also take a look at uh, lexing in, in, in Ruby, uh, sorry, uh, I mean lexing in Matt's Lisp. So um, if you have a, a Ruby, um, I mean a Matt's Lisp interpreter with you, um, and you just require Ripper, call dot lex on Ripper, pass in the code, and out comes the tokens that represents the code. So you have full, equals, and one, two, three in the last position of that array. Yeah, you can try it right now. So just to recap, we have actually taken um, the code and actually split it up into tokens. So the next phase will be the reader. So uh, what a reader do is, is that it basically reads code. So, and, um, but of course, it's not that simple. So it's going to take our tokens and change to transform them into S expressions. So what are S expressions? So it's something from Lisp. Uh, and uh, basically, in simple, what it is, is basically just nested arrays that uh, adds meaning to my tokens. So, but before we do that, I have to explain the, the grammar of the language because our implementation will be based on the grammar. So I'm going to show this scary looking thing, but don't worry, it's not uh, very difficult to understand. So it, right here, we have three lines, and each line represents a rule. The first rule is basically, uh, um, the, and in the rule, you'll see this colon, colon, equal operator. It means it's a or can be expanded to. So left-hand side is a, the right-hand side. So, and for that pipe operator, it's, uh, can be read as or. The plus operator can be read as or one or more. And the star operator means zero or more. So just to give an example, I'll use English, a subset of English. Uh, obviously, so uh, to, to give an example. So I have five rules here. So I have sentence. A sentence can be expanded to a subject followed by a verb followed by an object. And uh, a subject uh, is a noun. Uh, same for an object. Object are also nouns. And a verb can be eat or code or love. And nouns can be I, he, she, Ruby, or Python. So sentences that this grammar accepts can be I love Ruby, or he eats Python. By the way, the Python conference is also happening at the same time. I have no idea why, but yeah, so they want to like steal programmers from us. So anyway, yeah, I, I'm not a very big fan of Python, by the way, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, okay, back to our grammar. So let me explain what this grammar is. So for the first rule, our form or um, um, list is like an expression in Lisp. So um, a form is, uh, can be expanded to either a, a list or an atom. And a list is basically a bunch of forms uh, enclosed in a pair of parentheses or square brackets. And an atom uh, is basically a bunch of characters or a bunch of numbers or our true and false literals. So uh, like I said just now, the, liter the reader implementation is based on the grammar. So for our first rule, we're going to have a function that corresponds to it. So uh, in this function, I'm going to call it read form. I'm just going to take the first token and check whether it is an open parenthesis. If it is, I'm just going to call read list on it. If it's not, I'm going to call read atom. Simple as that. Just like five lines. Yeah. So as for the second rule, um, since it's, it's a bunch of tokens and close in parenthesis, I'm going to put it in the loop and call read form on it. Yeah. And as for our last rule, atom, so since it's uh, a 
a few cases of the strings, I'm going to put it into a case when statement and uh, with uh, comparing with against regular expressions and strings. So if it's an integer, I'll return the integer symbol along with the token itself. Right, so just to recap, I have converted my code into tokens and my tokens are transformed into S expressions. So now to the last stage. So what we're gonna do with S expressions, we're gonna actually transform this into abstract syntax tree. So what are abstract syntax tree? It's basically syntax trees that are abstract. <laughs> so it, well, it represents the synthetic structure of the code. And uh, just to give an ex example, so this expression here uh, will be represented by this tree uh, with uh, the add node and two children. Uh, the add node will be the root. So uh, the, children on the, the child on the left uh, is called the left operand, which corresponds to our symbol, my var. And the right child corresponds to the right operand, which is our integer 42. So uh, how is this implemented in code? Just like this. So my integer node uh, is basically a class that holds a value, the integer value. And for my add node, it's basically a class that holds references to the node objects. And the node objects are uh, to, the, to the left and right operands, and they themselves are node objects. So, and now move on, moving on to the most exciting part, which is bytecode generation. So, um, and um, one thing that's special about Ruby, I mean, Maslips and uh, Rubinius is that it actually uses a stack-based virtual machine. So what's a stack-based virtual machine? So basically, it's a virtual machine that operates, where its instructions operates, uh, its operands are actually on a stack. Right, so let me give you an example. Okay, so let's say I want to compute one plus two on my stack-based virtual machine. So on the left are my instructions, and on the right is my stack, where my instructions are going to operate on. So um, I have to, first, what I'm going to do is I'm going to push uh, the integer value one to the stack. Next, I'm going to push the integer value two to the stack. And next, I'm going to uh, execute the add instruction. So what this add instruction do is that it will pop uh, the operands. So um, one and two will be pop, and it will push the result onto the stack. What do you think will be on top of the stack after this instruction? Yep, I hear a tree, yes. That's right. So what if I want to multiply uh, the result of one plus two by three? So I'm gonna push three and execute the multiply instruction. So what do you think will be at the top of the stack right now? Nine, that's right, you guys are really smart. Right, so um, yeah, you can actually see this actually happening right now if you have an interpreter with you. You don't need to connect to the internet. You, if you have a Ruby interpreter, you guys are Rubyists, right? So you have an interpreter right now. So go to your interpreter, uh, and uh, we're gonna use this class from the Ruby VM module. The class is called instruction sequence. So um, assign your code uh, in the form of a string to a variable. So over here, I have a piece of code, which is 15 plus six times two. Then I'll pass it to this, uh, um, this method from that class. I'll call dot .compile on the code, and I'm go, gonna call disassem, or disassemble for short. Yeah. So um, it, will, it will actually return us this, and you'll see that 15 and six are being pushed onto the stack, or rather over here it uses the word put object, and it calls op plus, which uh, corresponds to the plus um, instruction. Then you'll push um, the the integer value two to the stack and calls and executes uh, multiply. Yep. So you can try it right now. So um, so as for Rubinius, how does it work? How are you going to generate a bytecode? So uh, the first thing we're going to do is that we're going to uh, create a class, an empty class, or rather uh, some form of interface where we uh, define the bytecode method. Yep. And um, what's cool about Rubinius is that it actually pr provides a pure math lips bytecode generation DSL, yes. So, um, so this is how the DSL look like. So in my integer node class, what do we do in the integers? We just push them to the stack, right? So in my bytecode method, I just have to um, call, or, or rather I just have to execute the push integer uh, instruction. So this is the DSL and this is how it looks like. It reads just like the bytecode. And for our add node, this is what we do. So we just have to push uh, the left operands bytecode and the right operands bytecode. We just call, sorry, the, the left operands and the right operands bytecode method, and we execute the plus instruction. 
So once you have actually implemented the bytecode instructions uh, for all your nodes, you have a working programming language. All right. Yes, obviously, um, I don't have a lot of time, so I'm actually, um, uh, <laughs> that, that is not a complete programming language. So, um, so where to get help if you need help? Uh, so I really recommend you to check out this repository. Uh, it has a very nice guide, a step-by-step -step guide to teach you how to implement a language, be it in Java, C, or Ruby. And most importantly, it has diagrams, very nice diagrams. And um, also, check out this repository. This is um, uh, it's actually a language implemented in Rubinus, um, and it's uh, done out by a bunch of beginners from the Rails Girls community. And of course, you can check out my repository and give a star if you like it. Right. And if you're interested in the internals of Ruby, uh, uh, yeah, go check out this book. It's called Ruby Under My Microscope. Yeah. That's all. Any questions? Uh, we welcome some questions for Jason. Where is if you have questions? Can you show us? Can you show us that repository? Those repositories that you, you know. Oh, sorry, again, I went too yeah. fast, right? Okay, so this is the Rubinius one, Queen Frankie slash Lenny, and this is the Mel one, Kanaka slash Mel, and of course, last but not least, my own repository, JSU slash. Yeah, I call it Melody. It's a sick code. It's really sick. Yeah. Nobody got that reference. Yet. It's okay. <laughs> any, any other questions? Hey, good. Hey, um, I don't know if you if you said this in your talk, and if you did, and I just forgot it, then I'm sorry. Uh, what got you interested in learning how to build your own programming language like a Lisp? You you you're saying why am I interested? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, why? Yeah. What what's the origin story behind this talk? I guess. Origin story. Uh, I was bitten by a spider. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, I always um, thought that because the I, I I so basically I I spent a lot of time on Hacker News. Um, so on Hacker News, uh, you have Paul Graham, Graham talking about Lisp. So and he he has all these blogs and all these articles. So it kind of inspired me. So and he he said that Lisp is really easy to implement and and I. One day I just tried it out and followed one of the guides right here. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. Any more questions for Jason? Okay. Um, right. It seems like. Oh, wait. Cool. Uh, so you showed an example where you generated bytecode from uh, the, the, the language. So is it possible to generate? Uh, 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 code in some other language <coughs> from that particular language. So you're saying, is it possible to, um, like, let's say I have a Java that compiles to this bytecode? Yeah, so using these tools, uh, the tools that you uh, talked about right now, yes. is it possible to generate, say, C, a, a C function from, uh, uh, not sorry, not, not, maybe not a C function, but uh, maybe a Ruby function from, uh, uh, the syntax that you just showed right now. Yes, um, the DSL actually compiles to um, the Rubinius virtual machine, so it actually has um, some instructions for you to uh, generate functions. I'm not sure whether that answered your question. Yeah. So there was a link right here. I think, yes. Yeah, there was a link right here. It's kind of small, and I went kind of fast. So we can check out like th he has a, it's an article about the DSL uh, in Rubinus. Yeah, so it, it will show you like what some of the constructs you can generate in your programming language. Okay, it seems like we have a last quick question. Uh, all right. Yeah. Hello. I got a question. Hi. Uh, why don't you use uh, Regal, for example, for lexing analysis and uh, Yatsutsu? Right. Uh, 
an ACC, for example, for parsing. Oh. Because um, uh, regular it seems to be uh, much better than usual regular expression since it, for example, allows to um, parse uh, recursive structures, and etc. Yes. Um, very simply because uh, the regular expression works. Once again? <laughs> it works just for my use case. Ah, oh, okay. Yeah, it. so, uh, yeah. <laughs> it is pretty, uh, it's, yeah, it, it just works. I don't need another dependency because it's not that high level like uh, Ruby uh, or, or like some other programming language like C or JavaScript. So I don't need like uh, such a, uh, I find it overkill to use Reco for just for the parsing like parentheses and square brackets. Yeah. Thanks. No problem. Um, thank you, Jason. Uh, for an, any other questions for Jason, you can reach him on his Twitter handle, which is? Jason Yo JS. Jason Yo JS. Uh, thank you very much.